Welcome to the Friday Power Lunch, a weekly show amplifying the voices of the Virginia grassroots. Each week, we provide engaging conversations about politics, culture, and women making change. Produced by the unstoppable women of Network Nova, our motto is, when we vote, we win. The Friday Power Lunch is recorded before a live Zoom audience. Follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and show us some love and become a sponsor through Patreon. The Friday Power Lunch, badass women getting things done. So glad you're all here. It's great and fun to be back. It is September 9th and welcome to the Friday Power Lunch. I'm Catherine White, your host, bringing you the guests, the issues, the action and amplifying the voice of the grassroots to get things done. And of course, to make politics very fun. And today's theme is labor organizing, uh, the union boom of 2022. And we couldn't be more thrilled to have such a special woman here uh, Virginia Diamond. Let's introduce our guests, bring up these plenty strong and tough union folks. Virginia Diamond, president of the Northern Virginia AFL-CIO. Hello. Hi, Hi are Catherine. You, are you Great. feeling rev, revved up? Revved up. Thanks for having us. Great topic. Thank you. I know. So where are you uh, at, at your home today? I see your Starbucks logo in the back, and there's a lot to talk about about that. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, I hope you got your dancing shoes on. We are going to have a lot of fun today. So thank you, Jenny, for being here. And then I'm excited to bring up our next guest, Raul Castro, Senior Council Representative of the Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters. Lots of words there. For a Hello, great how are you doing today? Uh, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. So how long have you been a carpenter? So, uh, uh, you know, my name is Raul Castro. I'm with the Eastern Atlantic States. Uh, yeah, it's okay. We're just chitty chatting. I don't like, yeah. So, how long have you been a, a carpenter? I'm just curious before we get to the interview later. I got you. So, uh, I've been a member of the Carpenters Union for 22 years. Awesome. And okay, super. Well, we're excited to meet you. We're glad to have you in the room. Um, and the Carpenters Union is, uh, I'm interested to talk about, especially your, your role around immigrants' rights and, uh, and actually their force in the labor movement. So we're excited to unpack that with you today, Roll. So thank you for coming in and dancing in the room with us today. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, and I'm very excited to call up Meridian Stiller, a labor, a labor organizer, and I don't know if you've ever would have thought of yourself as a labor organizer. Did you first think I'm a coffee maker, Meridian? Or, um, you know, mostly I thought I'm a teenager with a summer job, um, <laughs> and that quickly turned into something much, much bigger than that. I love it, and that you're at. So everybody knows that you are now back at college. Uh, back in college for the first time. I'm a I'm a college freshman this year. I was with Starbucks uh, during my high school year, my senior year of high school. Yeah, well, that's quite an experience. So we're all excited to talk to you about what you experienced during that time. I think that's so amazing. And you really are the future. And I'm sure when Virginia, we talk about, we talk to Jenny about this, this interesting part of this boom that's going on and coming from really a youth labor uh, lens. So I can't wait to talk to you about that later. So thank you. Meridian, thank for you for having me. Appreciate it. All righty, and uh, we then have Dr. Julius Reynolds, Loudoun County, S-E-I-U, Virginia 512, bringing it. What's up, Loudoun? Hey, how are you, man? How you doing? <laughs> oh, so I have that loud voice and you have that, 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 dark, that deep voice, I love it. Well, <laughs> Julius, we're proud to stand alongside you and brothers and sisters in the movement. We went out to Loudoun. Uh, we always try to bring it when we can. And so we were really, I can't wait to talk about what, what went on out there and especially the collective bargaining. So we're real pleased that you were able to spend some time with us today. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. What's on, you got some good books in the background. I always like to look at what people are reading. So very good. All right, so everybody, 
hold on to your pants. Let's go and talk about the rules of the road. You know, we have a friendly room. We love to use the chat to communicate and make sure you're sharing some of the uh, get out the vote activities you're doing. But, you know, we also like to, don't tolerate any kind of nastiness. So we'll, you know, stairs over here. Actually, today I'm in stairs house up in the tree house I, and she's downstairs. So she'll boot you out and uh, you'd rather stay in the room with us. We're a lot of fun. So thank you for that. And after chat, favorite part, I can't wait to see and talk in the after chat after one o'clock today um, to find out what everybody is doing, especially after the, in DC, if anybody from the art and activism folks went down there, they had the big event really fighting that pipeline. So if any pipeline people, uh, any are in the room or people that went to the bell power, tower to fight for reproductive rights, stay in the after chat. Let's talk about that. And, and then also, of course, I can't leave off the important part, become a patron of the show. Uh, it's a great way to support our work. We really appreciate it. All that, all your support really helps us keep the lights on and it really it's really super to keep us going. So thank you for all the patrons in the room. I love seeing them. I can see your screens, the purple. So you do get a special background. So that's awesome. And um, lastly, you know, what we do is the Friday Power Lunch is a great way for us to connect everybody in the state, but also we do the Women's Summit for people in the room that doesn't know what that is. It's our annual event. We pull together and we build the coalitions across Virginia to get together. We went to Nova. We had a great summit there and we went to rural Virginia. And I'd like to share, We were this was August 12th and 13th. I would love to share what we did in rural uh, Virginia and union organizing is really strong out there and the Democrats are smart to rally around that. So let me just show you what we've been doing. <laughs> So part of what we do here is this is such an important event. And guess what? You can see on my screen, we're going next to Virginia Beach. That's next weekend. We'll put the links in the chat. Sign up. The biggest part of this is really getting out the vote. We hope labor joins us. We're trying to work with uh, all of our sponsors and different folks to hit the doors because guess what? We will win in Virginia Beach if we knock the doors. It's up to us. So I hope you join us. 
Moms Demand Action will be joining us as will Planned Parenthood, Repo Rising, Repo Rising. We're just gonna have everybody out. So I just wanted you to get a taste of how much fun we're gonna be at some breweries. We're gonna be at the Museum of Modern Art and we'll talk about that later. So Louisa Borowski, let's talk about how we're getting busy for freedom and democracy, friend. Let's busy. do it. Yeah, so I know we talked a lot about the special session that was going to be happening in Richmond this week, and I'm here to report there was a whole lot of nothing that went on, on that, at that session. Yunkin had talked originally about a 15-week abortion ban. He wasn't even in the state for the session. He went out ca um, campaigning for somebody else in another state. So was he, the, wait, can I ask you a question? Was he with Dr. Oz? No, he was not, actually. I forget who it was, but it wasn't Dr. Oz. Um, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so the good news is we didn't have to deal with abortion um, this week. However, I want to encourage people, let's keep the drumbeat going. This is a good issue for us this year. You can see Republicans are starting to back away from it because they're realizing it's not helping them in the polls. We want to make sure that we are reminding people that the women's reproductive freedom is on the ballot this year. So we'll make sure that we have ongoing social media um, images that you guys can post out there, but really an important issue, not only for Virginia, but for across the country. But of course, as we all know, it is getting out the vote season. Since we vote early and can vote early, it is almost that time. So I want to encourage you to get involved in some way. One option is order a sign about voting early, put it in your yard, help people get the information so that they don't wait until the last minute to cast their ballot. Stair has the uh, has ordered some yard signs and you can uh, get them directly from her and we'll put that link in the chat. So that's an easy way to start getting involved. Another is joining a grassroots canvas for democracy as Catherine brought up, there'll be a fantastic one in Virginia Beach. We're also gonna have one for Abigail Spanberger in October. So please think about, can you set aside one or two weekends or three weekends really, you know, before the election to get out the vote? knock on those doors. This is the easy time. This is when you're just helping people figure out what's their voting plan. How are they going to make sure that their voice is heard in the election this fall? And then the other thing we want to be pushing is early voting. We want people to get those their votes in so they don't wait until the last minute. We're going to have social media graphics for you to post starting the week of September 19th. You will get them in the Tuesday tidbits from Stair, or if you're on my email list, you'll get it from me as well. Please, please help us send out those posts or retweet posts that are already out there. We just want to make sure, again, that everybody has a plan and has all the information they need. And then finally, this is the fun one. We have a group out in Loudoun County who is doing Bring Your Girlfriends to Vote Day as the first day of early voting. So I wanna encourage other people to do this as well. I did it last year with my girlfriends. We all went and voted and then we went and got a glass of wine. It was a fantastic outing. So please consider how are you bringing friends with you to the polls and how do you make it something fun? And if you are making it something fun, put it on social media so people get a chance to uh, see it and get inspired to do so as well. And then of course, Catherine, last thing, we have a coalition meeting for the Virginia Grassroots Coalition on Sunday. If you are interested in attending, I will put the link in the chat. We are going to be welcoming new members at the meeting. We're gonna be discussing obviously the 22 elections. Uh, we'll have updates from some of our issue working groups. And then for those who um, live in Arlington, there's an issue called the missing middle legislation that is um, quite controversial and that's going to be our last discussion. So if that's something you have been wondering about, you want more information on, um, Matt DeFerrante will be joining us to have that conversation. So lots coming up and I'll put some links in the chat. I'm very excited about that. Bring your girlfriends to the polls. I think those kind of things really um, get people excited, especially when you could put it on social media. So I think we should work. It's a great campaign, get some hashtags going. And I, I know maybe at the end, if we have time, I'll get Robin ready. 
or stare. I was thinking maybe we show some of that vote early um, stuff that we do have. I think it's awesome what Dennis made. And I encourage people in this coalition, in this room, to join us for all the vote early um, you know, initiatives we're doing. We really missed that opportunity last year. And we'd be we really, really, it'd be silly to make the same mistake again. So we're not going to. You're not I, going to get beaten in the early vote by the Republicans this year. Um, so let's, Catherine, I'll go ahead and put it up right now. Yeah, show it. Let's show it. And then I, I want to show everybody because I'm real proud of what Dennis. There's the sign. You can order as many. And guess what? You can use it again the next year. It links to the I will vote. I'm pretty sure it links it to that, and I know it does. So it's really great. You put them there, people could use their phones, and it is awesome. And we also have also um, great postcards up and signs up that we'll be doing for like the freedom and democracy or on the ballot, and those are very exciting too. Last, I wanna mention, uh, cause I always love to point out when people are doing something interesting that really galvanizes and gets people up and running, and I don't know if Andy uh, Pavroid is in the room, but he's going to come to the after chat. He's in the Providence Dems, and he's doing a voter mobilization fair on September 18th. And we're going to put that information. If you are um, a group that would like to table in that event, and, and the Providence Dems are really ready to welcome you. So labor, uh, women's rights, uh, WOFA, any group, and I will put that contact information, get a hold of Andy. And so get, get a part of being in that fair. It's at the Dunloring Fire Station. But I love to make sure these committees are doing new great things. So I'm excited to talk about that. So thank you, Louisa. The Absolutely. wonderful, badass, strong leader of the Virginia Grassroots Coalition. Please join us, and that information will be in the chat. So, yeah, good for us. Yay. Um, so, thank you. Awesome. So, I want to also say, I see Jenny Kitchen in the room, and I was, uh, Jenny Kitchen ran, ran out and, um, in rural Virginia, and I saw her, that she went to the art and activism pipeline movement. I'm interested to hear about that in the after chat. We have to keep our eye on that pipeline. You know, the little dirty deal of what we're all excited about that passed, which was the Inflation Act, Lower Inflation Act, had some of that pipeline, uh, you know, kind of deregulation stuff in there. But we will continue that fight. And like any long fight, any long struggle, that is what we learned from unions and organizers like uh, Virginia Diamond, who I would love to bring up to talk about this with, um, we'll start with Jenny and then we'll pop in the rest of the team. So yes, my friend, so much to be excited about. Are you, you know, let's just start from the beginning. First you, you're the president. Um, how long have you been president now? Is this your- um I was, I became president of Northern Virginia Labor Federation in 2016. So I guess six years. Uh, we have about 55 different labor organizations that are members of our organization. And we stretched down to, sorry, we stretched down to Spotsylvania and out to Winchester. Yeah. Is there like five, how many, uh, is there like 500 groups with you or chapters across uh, the AFL CIO chapters or? Yeah, there are there we have uh, there are 55 different unions. Basically, all of the unions right. are part of the AFL CIO for the most part and part of our organization. So, yep. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit of the history about it, and then let's get into what you get a little bit of the history, and, and then you know what you've been doing these last so many you know years, and then what you feel like is really going on this year with union organizing. Thank you so much. I mean, I would love to just talk about the um, exciting developments that are taking place that have been taking place this year. Uh, there's really been a, um, a resurgence in the labor movement and labor organizing. And I think what it is, is a primarily a generational uprising uh, among the uh, Gen Z and some millennial people who are uh, recognizing that they are likely to be the first generation that will have a lower standard of living than previous generations. They don't, they don't have living wages. They have to work multiple jobs. Uh, they don't have affordable health care, and they're certainly not going to be able to um, retire. And so this is the, um, th this is the source of the upsurge. They've rediscovered the labor movement. But I'd just like to put it in context to say that right now, um, the concentration of wealth and the income inequality in our country is now at the point that it was at 100 years ago. We're essentially a gilded age level um, 
of inequality. So 40 years ago, uh, about a third of workers were members of unions. Uh, and now only 6% of private sector workers are union members. And as a direct result of that, uh, there has been a redistribution of wealth and income from the working class and what used to be the middle class up into the, one, 90, the, the top 10% and mostly the top 1%. So the concentration of wealth is enormous. All the productivity gains have gone to the upper income groups. And so we really think that um, the only way to seriously address economic and racial inequality is to support uh, organized union organizing and the redevelopment of unions to the point where, again, you know, at least a third of the, of the workforce is in unions. Then we have a, a counterforce against the economic power of the uh, of big corporations. Well, why don't we talk about the big corporations? You know, I noted that the discussion, you know, two kinds of discussions going on where you have corporations, heads of CEOs saying, you know, we really don't need this kind of union organizing. We don't need, uh, you know, we don't need workers doing this. I mean, they're, they're, they have one story that unions are kind of dead and gone, no longer relevant. But, the, but really the story is different when you really look at what's going on. Uh, so what is the disconnect there when you talk about corporations and then actually the, the workers' rights and what they really want or not getting from you know, the corporate workforce? You know, you're making a great point. Um, as the workers have organized, you know, in Starbucks, it started in Buffalo. Now there's 240 stores, but that has spread obviously to the Amazon warehouses, REI, Trader Joe's, Apple, et cetera. And all of the CEOs of those large corporations are dead set against their workers having any power. And of course, you know, it's, it's clear that what they want to do is maintain control. And also they want to um, c continue to concentrate wealth and power, you know, at the very top. And unfortunately, I think it's important for everyone to understand that our labor laws are broken just as our immigration laws are broken. So for example, in Starbucks, uh, Chipotle, um, other stores, uh, what the companies have done is they have fired workers who are leading organizing campaigns. They have taken away people's health care. They have closed unionized stores. Uh, they are threatening people and they are getting away with that because there really aren't penalties and there's no real enforcement to prevent that. And so um, what we really need is everybody on, on this call and in this network to understand that if we're going to really address economic inequality and support these, this younger generation and their efforts to achieve economic security, we have to be out there taking the side of the workers against big corporations. And no matter how much those big corporations virtue signal or say, hey, we're good Democrats or we support, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Black Lives Matter, or racial, racial justice and LGBT. They say those things, but meanwhile, they literally target those workers in their workforces when they try to unionize. It's happening everywhere. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, very interesting. And I, I'm thinking about the social justice aspect of this. And especially when we talk about Starbucks and we have Meridian here that we'll talk more about that experience that they had, um, but that this kind of organic in a way, like a, here you have people that work at Starbucks, very social justice minded, and it this movement starts out of there. And then, you, like you said, the Howard Schultz's of the world are really like annoyed, right? And all their practices to shut this down, very interesting. But it, you know, it's a different way. Let's talk about the different way that this is organizing. You don't see this as like top heavy, where you have you know the old style auto worker, like you know sort of that look of the union guy working at the shop. This is like you said, a different generational look, and an also, and also, you know, we're talking baristas. We're talking about people that aren't going to be long in the labor force. Maybe five years. Maybe they're going to go on to college. It's not like when my dad was in the union, he stayed there his whole life, right? It is different, but we have to protect these workers because they're the service industry. COVID exposed what really is going on and how important these workers are. So it's very interesting to me, this, um, this concept about, it's almost store to store. It's, well, you know, so talk about that, like how different it is store to store, here's a Starbucks here, and maybe the challenges of, 
you know, it's not just one big, it's here, there, and a little bit everywhere. Well, um, I think that it's important to, um, to, to what you just said, that this is the service sector that we're mm -hmm. talking about here. This is exactly parallel to what happened in the 30s and 40s in the manufacturing sector. So it's exactly the same thing. You have workers who are not making much money. You might say that those are temporary jobs. That's not actually true. There are Starbucks employees who have been there 15, 20 years. And these are people who are sometimes working two jobs, but they're devoted to their work. And these service sector jobs, which are the jobs of the new economy, whether it's hospitality, restaurants, uh, retail, uh, logistics, warehouses, those are all the jobs that are exactly the same as the manufacturing jobs were in the 30s and 40s. They have to be family sustaining jobs. And so this uprising by this generation is really identical to what happened in the past. And people used to say, wait a minute, these factory workers, those are not good jobs. Why should they be making middle class? Well, it's exactly the same thing with retail, hospitality, and the service sector. These jobs, billion dollar corporations, um, people like Melody Hobson, who are, is a big Democratic donor, the chair of the board of Starbucks, they're keeping all of the money. <laughs> and oh. these people are not, uh, you know, this population of workers that are in the service sector, they, these are jobs that they need to support their families and oh. they should be making living wages. And that's, that's why they're unionizing. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. And I didn't mean it that they, somehow it's, it's more... Um, what like I got started service sector, right? 16 waiting tables for many, many, many years in and out of college, it supported me. And I think, you know, I think what it is, is it's almost the most unprotected job I was ever in. Um, didn't have health insurance, right? Got sick and went to the hospital, had no health insurance. I was making $1.89 an hour. And I, I'm so, these jobs are so important and, you know, we've become this big service economy. Um, but some people will, will move on. It doesn't mean those can't be quality. They can't, they shouldn't have benefits, like you said. Um, and this is how, you know, it's, so it's a really good point that you made. And it's because I know back in the day, you you could sustain your whole family being a, uh, you know, butcher, uh, working in a grocery store, being at the deli counter. These were unionized jobs. And, you know, these are ways that you can send your kids to college. So I appreciate that comment. So I want to make sure we get in. Uh, some of your team up here. I'd love to call up um, and Raul Castro to join this part of the conversation. And then maybe we bring up Meridian also, and we can bring up the whole team if we want, and we may be able to play off each other around some input on this. But Raul, what, adding to this conversation about the um, carpenters and the bringing that voice of, of the immigrant voice and some of the you know issues going on around there from discrimination or labor abuse. Tell us about what you do and what's, what's on your mind about that uh, part of the union organizing. So, you know, our mission is uh, pretty simple, right? You, we try to, we work to improve uh, working conditions of folks out there and being able to bring them into the middle class by uh, negotiating agreements with contractors that offer uh, pensions, family health care, annuities, and I think the most important of all, uh, free training. Uh, the issues that uh, we have uh, run into uh, are, you know, there's the, a large number of immigrant workers in our industry like myself, and uh, they've been exploited every day uh, by, you know, they work with contractors that uh, don't pay them uh, good wages. So they pay them cash money to avoid paying uh, payroll taxes, they don't pay them overtime, and in many extreme cases, uh, they don't pay them at all. Mm. So, you know, that makes it harder for unions to uh, negotiate uh, better agreements with the contractor associations that we work with, and it also makes it harder for responsible uh, employers to provide more benefits and wages to their workers when they you know, when, when you look at the whole uh, issue uh, and you look at how the process works, you know, a, a subcontractor that does construction submits a bid to an end user to build a building or whatever, uh, he needs to be competitive. So if his number is too high and he's competing with people who are cheating the system, uh, contractors who are uh, cheating the system to uh, 
to be able to be more competitive and exploiting workers, well, automatically the contractor that submits the lowest bid will get the job, right? So that's mm -hmm. how a lot of uh, responsible contractors have been going under uh, for a long period of time. So uh, one of the things that we that we have been doing is to educate the workforce on basic uh, labor uh, rights and you know let them know that whether you are documented or undocumented, once you work for somebody, you're entitled to the money, you're entitled to a lot of things, and it's okay to come forward and file complaints. So we educate workers on that, and then we connect them to uh, uh, lawyers and uh, other organizations, uh, DOL or government agencies, who could help them collect uh, unpaid wages or any other issue that they may have uh, that they may have had. Yeah, and and Ginny, in your perspective, in this in Virginia and the right to work state, uh, in in this kind of labor, which Raul's talking about in organizing, um, does it does it then the is what are the protections for somebody or you both can chime in on that for somebody that is undocumented or uh, documented, but there is some abuses going on in a right to work state is, in your opinion. Well, re regardless of, of status, mm -hmm. uh, workers have the right, have the same employment rights. And uh, okay. the Carpenters Union is a predominantly uh, immigrant uh, workforce. And what they do is they give these people free training uh, so that they, uh, and they're paid while they're being right. trained and they end up, you know, with really good careers. But what we need from elected officials and Raul can get into this work better than me is we need them to uh, establish labor standards and prevailing wages so that these this vulnerable workforce is protected proactively and not just having to file lawsuits. Yeah, Raul. So yeah, going back to a little bit of that, uh, you look at, uh, at the DMV area, which uh, our office covers, you know, you look at DC, they have like the best wage theft uh, le uh, legislation which is a really good tool to, to help workers one, once they got uh, uh, in a situation where they didn't get paid. Uh, if you go to Maryland, it's a little, uh, you know, it's not as good as DC, but then you move into Virginia and it's, it's horrible, right? Mm -hmm. So things like that uh, can prevent and help workers in the long run. But uh, as Virginia was saying, you know, preventing wage theft and the underground economy are key to, to success and to the whole situation that we're talking about here. Uh, you know, once you work on the job site where you didn't get paid, it could take years for you to get the money, hmm. the money. Uh, but if we could get the state to adopt uh, pro labor agreements, that could definitely uh, help workers in the long run. If we could uh, pressure uh, end users like Amazon and all the large companies that work around here, which many depend from, from, from the government to, make business, you know, because they, they have, there's, there are so many government uh, contracts out there, you know, to force them to uh, adopt a responsible contractor language or labor standards, whatever you want to call it, uh, to make sure that they have procedures in place uh, or like betting contractors, make sure that the contractors they give the work to are contractors that haven't been sued for waste theft or any major violations in the past. You know, that that's one way of fixing some of these issues, but uh, as always, you know, in Virginia, it seems like everything is a, uh, a struggle, so. <laughs> well, you brought up the legislature. Is there anything we should be looking for, Raul, in policy this year, uh, or when you work with the elected that you are, uh, you know, hyper-focused on? I know we didn't get to overturn the right to work state. You know, we've tried, we've been working on that. But anything that's on your guys' mind moving forward that could be helpful? I think for starters, we need to uh, uh, make the uh, uh, wage theft legislation in, in, in uh, Virginia stronger than mm -hmm. what, uh, you know, we uh, in DC, you're able, well, even in Virginia, you're able to hold general contractor uh, liable uh, for unpaid wages from subcontractors. But it's harder to do in Virginia than it is in other areas. And I mean, I'm, this is just basics. I mean, I guess there's right. many people do. I think I'll defer that to Virginia since uh, she's a lawyer. On this. Well, also, also, the local government is absolutely plays a critical role and right. really help. They can adopt 
uh, prevailing wages, which they have in our area, except for Alexandria so far. Um, and they can do uh, project labor agreements, community benefit agreements that ensure that local residents have access to good jobs, good union jobs. Mm. No, that that's 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 great. It's true. And, and from a customer consumer perspective, like I have a just a question: when you hire somebody to work in your house and they're just doing a job for you, they're a contractor. How do you roll a check to make sure that the laborers in their house are being treated fairly? That there are, you know, that that's how do you know? Because I'm just thinking about that now. When you, we do go hire a painter or something, how, what's our responsibility on the consumer side? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be too worried about like a homeowner hiring somebody to to do a little bit of work on the house. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is a much bigger issue. I mean, if you look at uh, a residential neighborhood and you go there and you talk to people and you ask them about their working conditions, I mean, they're going to be pretty bad. So uh, yeah. you need to start, right? You, you, look, you look at housing and you look at the price of housing. Uh, one thing I always tell people, uh, labor had nothing to do with the price of your house because at times people don't even get paid for the work that they did. So, uh, you know, but how do you make sure that people are getting treated right? Uh, I guess, you know, uh, by making sure that the contractor that you hire, uh, you know, pays the workers with uh, checks with deductions that he's paying for overtime. Um, all that. You know, are you offering benefits? Uh, do you have uh, pensions? Do you have uh, free training? You know, all the things that could help people to move up into the middle class. I think yeah. that would be for questions for anybody who's doing any type of work. Yeah, I know what, uh, you know, with going back to COVID, how difficult it was, especially, you know, I live in Anadol and, 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 and you're in Alexandria, you're raised, you went to Alexandria High School, is that, you know, there is such a strong immigrant population here. It's, um, we, you know, a lot of people looking for work and there's so there's a lot of area like you said of worker abuse and this is so important the stuff you do when people do want to move up and get a good 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 paying job you know it's great that we have those protections so thank you so i'd like to pop over to meridian to to i know you guys are all excited i could feel like jenny is is just beaming <laughs> very excited meridian I, I know people may have popped in later but you um, you're joining us. You are just a young organizer. At, you're now at college, but you had a lot to do down in the Richmond area with organizing your union. Let's talk about that. Um, talk about this experience and how it's changed your worldview and, and yeah, tell Absolutely. us the story. Um, sure. So I think that my introduction to the labor movement um, tells a narrative of hope, not only in um, there we, we got go. you. We got you. <laughs> Not only in uh, the trajectory of my career path, but also in fostering a sense of community as well. Um, I think that as a young adult going into the workforce, it can be a very isolating experience, especially in this particular um, very stifling kind of political polarization and late stage capitalism and all that. Um, there's a lot of hopelessness that we can feel as young adults. And um, because of this kind of American individualism um, that we have in society at the moment, I think it's greatly corporate sponsored. I think advertisement has a lot to do with it. Um, but because of this kind of individualistic um, outlook that we are fed, it is hard to foster a sense of community when heading into the workforce. And that was a big thing for Starbucks as well. Um, one of the reasons I applied to work at Starbucks in particular, um, and one of the things that they advertise a great deal when they're in the hiring process is that it claims to be this fantastic community of its workers. Um, we're called partners. We're um, told that it's going to be this great uh, kind of family experience. And I think that when building a community, it's very important to think whose interests are being served by the formation of the community. 
Starbucks has very explicit uh, market interests, econ economic interests, obviously. So they know that by advertising such a community, they're going to draw in people, but it's not a community that's going to be of great value to the workers because it is, serves the exclusive purpose of um, building up Starbucks's economy. On the other hand, unions are also a great community resource, um, but the interest served by a union is very clearly by the workers for the workers. And so a lot of people say, um, you know, why do you need a union? Starbucks is this close knit family company. And I say mm -hmm. that it has everything to do with who has the social power in the community. And I think that I have found great community, not only with my coworkers in Starbucks Workers United, but with the labor community as a whole. And it's, it's for me, it has shaped um, my experience of how I believe that I have power interacting uh, with the world socially and politically. And it has made me feel a lot more hopeful about my ability to create change. Wow. I think we're all blown away. I, I love your story. So going to get hired at Starbucks, applying for this job, and now, you know, what an experience you've had. And that's amazing. I mean, just your ability to really just, you know, share that with us. Um, so, so what now? So now that you're doing this, I mean, this is big. We see this boom. We say, especially Starbucks seems to be really leading this with the young people a lot. And you see this kind of community building. So now that you're back at school, um, what do you, or is this going to influence maybe what you're going to study even? Will you go back to work at Starbucks? Like we talked about this industry, when you want to look for a job, is this union going to, is this now you're just, you're just union strong? Is this? I would, I'm definitely union strong. I think, I think I'm not going to ever be able to work anywhere again without at least talking about organizing with my coworkers. Um, but it's definitely influenced um, my, my, kind of path of studying. When I was in high school, I was, I was organizing um, my Starbucks store through my senior year of high school and my senior summer. Um, and at that point in time, I thought that I wanted to be an engineer. Um, I am now a geography political science major um, in my first year of college. And I chose geography because at, I didn't know what it was at first. Like I thought, is that what people learn if they want to teach geography in school, which I didn't want to do. Um, but through talking to people at my college, I, I've learned that it's really about um, studying demographics in relation to space, which is applicable to so many fields. And it is also obviously applicable to unionization. Um, I'm taking a course about um, urbanization and forming uh, community in the fast-paced urban environment. Um, I'm taking a, a course about how um, human rights are viewed from a kind of NGO perspective and how they use um, media to convey their messages. And I think that these classes are really helping um, really helping me learn more about right. how I can make an impact um, in my community. And that's what I would like to go forth and do. Well, it's great. And I think it's so true. And I, I have a feeling that young people, the message is that they're here to really make this change. And they want, they, you know, it's, we know that unions are popular. It really is that, that people support unions, but young people are really leading this fight. So we're so happy to hear from you, Meridian. And I want to make sure that you stick around. We're going to take, as we say, a little, little break and talk about, and we'll, cause we're going to bring Julius up in a second, but I wanted to make sure um, that we do a little 
station break for the Women's Summit, and then we will come back to the conversation with Dr. Julius Reynolds from Loudoun. So let's make sure that we don't miss the opportunity to tell and share with everybody in the room since we're only a week away with the Women's Summit. Plenty strong, we're going strong, and uh, we wanna bring up some of those details, Robin. Uh, we'll go over it. I'm very excited. Um, to make sure that everybody knows we're gonna to go to Virginia Beach. So we're packing our towels, bathing suits, ready to go. We have a three day weekend and we hope you'll join us. There's still time to get a ticket. We wanna fill the room because we really wanna make sure that we hit the doors for Lane Luria. Folks, we can win if we hit the doors. We really gotta to work together. So Friday night, we're gonna bring the fun. We're going to the Shack on 8th in Virginia Beach. Uh, we're gonna have uh, people, the delegate Nadarius Clark, we will have different, Senator McClellan is gonna be joining us around the fire pit. That Friday night social is gonna be a lot of fun at 6 p.m. We'll have elected activists, advocates, uh, Jamie Locke from Planned Parenthood, I'm pretty sure is gonna be joining us at the fire pit. So we will have a lot of fun. That's just on Friday night. So we get settled in because on Saturday morning, we'll be at the modern, the Museum of Contemporary Art at the MOCA. And we will start that up at 830 doors open. We have over about 20 or 25 tables at, in our advocacy fair. And then we're all into win festival. And this will be fantastic. We're going to be kicking it off with the, some senators, some badasses from Hampton Road, Senator Lucas, Mamie Locke, Senator McClellan will be in that also. We'll have Elaine Luria there. We're also going to have some of the delegates like Delegate Helmers coming down to speak. And we're going to also be talking about the issues. And we have poets, we have teens with a purpose so doing some poetry. So we are going to have a really good time. That includes a box lunch. If you sign up, to be part of this because you're going to need your energy because we're going to hit the doors at 1 30 if you know we're going to be out on the doors and then starts all the fun stuff so saturday afternoon we have postcarding door door knocking we also be registering voters with the virginia dems that locally do this at the farmer's market. So you do not want to miss this. Hey, and if you want to take a break, we actually have some uh, fun stuff planned. If you want to sign up for a tour of the Vibe District in Virginia Beach, or also the Brock Environmental Set Center, take a little break and you, you all deserve it. So we do have limited signups for those fun opportunities. So who doesn't want to come join us in Virginia Beach? It's our last stop. And then we're going to go all in until we win this damn thing November 8th, because it will set the stage for 2023. So I hope we, we all know that. So I'm peaching through the crowd. Choir. And then lastly, on Saturday night, we'll be at Smart Mouth. We're calling all candidates. If you're a candidate in the area, come by for a hot minute on the mic. Let us know about if you're running for office, but we also want to make sure that you've knocked doors with us that afternoon. Here it is. Yes, it's okay. With its Smart Mouth Brewery on Saturday night kicking that off at 6 p.m. And that will be a lot of fun. Don Scott will actually be there and Shelly Simons will also be helping me MC that night. So we hope you can join us. All right. So little commercial break, but back to the action. I'd love to bring up Dr. Uh, Julius Reynolds. Oh yeah, hello, there you are, my friend. So what, so just the, just the brief takeaway from what you heard before you, uh, what's your heart talking when you think about your union, your brothers and sisters, and this fight you're in, you're the loud and chair of SEIU. Just want to make sure for people in the room, but what's your heart talking about right now? Well, my heart is flip flopping over here in Meridian, uh, knowing that our future is in good hands. And it makes me think that I wasted a lot of my youth on mindless activities. <laughs> See what this younger brother is doing. I'm just uh, amazed and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that uh, we know that we have leadership coming up behind us. I'm going to need somebody to pay my social security. So. <laughs> That's one way to look at it, right? No, and putting it in perspective too, I mean, you, and your sense of labor organizing, like you said, you just made me think about the shoulders we stand on. And, and, and we talked about, you had a lot to do was reading with the black union members. A lot of you know times people forget the history of labor you, you know, organizing. Talk a little bit about that piece of it and then we'll get into the collective bargaining. But I, I love to just really uplift unions. I feel like they're just 
such an important part of our story in America that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so from a black perspective, um, uh, we know that historically uh, there was a time when, um, you know, back in the 30s and 40s, a lot of people don't know this, that the poor economic uh, whites and blacks were attempting to come together to form a union and the powers that be white supremacy at that time felt it best that they be divided. And so they use what we call, what I call white wages. And then white wages simply says that, you know, just being white is good enough and you're better than black people. So um, they use that to conquer and divide um, um, any uprisings of the unions at that time. And that played itself out historically over the years um, just to keep the two groups separated. Um, yeah. We, they have more in common than they had difference. And so, you know, poor is poor. <laughs> when yeah. Black old. That tactic is, you know, definitely been used from the very beginning in our laws, you know, and and, and definitely in the union. Uh, and now, and so now, uh, what is your perspective on how you're organizing now um, around these issues? Do you find that now it's just a the more, you know, integrated? We're talking the power yes. together is really there now. More, more, more. Yes, very much. I mean, you know, our motto is unions for all. And so that means that uh, regardless of your race, creed or whatever, you know, everybody deserves to be part of a union, particularly in, their, in respective workplaces, and everybody deserves everything that comes along with the union. Right. You know, uh, benefits that cuts across every type of line possible out there. So um, that's really the drawing point for me is that we're no longer divided like we used to be. Um, it's um, very yeah. unifying people that look like me and people that are different from me. Yeah, it serves a, a purpose of, like you said, of we always, the people at the top making these millions and billions of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Wanting us to fight for these scraps down here and it works to their benefit to, right. to keep people separated. So let's jump over to the collective bargaining. You know, how important it is when you're talking about what we see going on, not just in Loudoun, but you are representing Loudoun today. Um, we saw in Fairfax County, these collective bargaining wins. Talk, a lot, talk about why is collective bargaining, what is it and why is it important? Well, collective bargaining uh, allows um, uh, workers to actually come to the table and, and, and talk about things that impact them in their work environment, things that to improve themselves in their work environment, living wages, uh, health, uh, whatever has it that... Um, keeps you at the margins in your workplace and it finally allows you to come to the table and establish a dialogue with those powers that be and say these are the things that we stand in desperate need of and so um when you don't have that um it, 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 it there's not a level playing field and it, it impacts your quality of life not only on the job but um you take that stuff home to your family mm -hmm. and so uh, it improves us in so many facets of our lives um, it's just not in the workplace. People think that it's just in the workplace, but most of what we do in the workplace, we take home to our families. Most right. of what we do on the job, <laughs> particularly um, those people that work on the front line are responsible for the quality of life <laughs> in that respective right. So, you know, I always say we're kind of like um, the people behind the scenes in the movie scene, you know, we, you know, you wonder why that scene is coming to life. <laughs> um, right. You know, you look at the actors, but there's people behind the scenes that are responsible for that 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 way the county looks <laughs> and the way well, it comes off. It's so true. And what you said, you know, what your words stick in my head. When community when workers thrive, the community thrives. So I think your mm -hmm. point is when people have a good paying job, when they can support their family, put food on the table, not only it brings dignity, but it brings to the community where you have parks, you have investments and in all that infrastructure there. And it's vibrant, you know, nothing's worse in a community that doesn't have work. Right. Right. It, 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 no, nothing's worse than to me, you know, um, when we talk about collective bargaining, we often talk about it and, you know, <laughs> this language that somehow escapes people. But when you just boil it down, it's really about um, showing a, a, a sense of humanity and compassion in the workplace. Um, <laughs> that's right. really all it you know, and if, if, if that's something that you, 
you can't get with by I worry about the people that stand in leadership that are over top of us when if that's not something they can wrap their brain around, then how can you expect to have a, a, a workforce that um is happy and, 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 and happy when they come to the job and do the things that they do when you won't even have a, a dialogue with me on what needs to be improved. So, you know, I said it's just about humanity, dignity, and respect in the workplace. And, and it's not about me getting everything I want, and it's not about them having everything they want. It's about us sitting down at the table together and, and trying to have what we're close to a right. one win situation in the workplace. So. Well, it reminds me too, like in when with when COVID hit and we saw the, the the home care workers and different workers and the risk there and how important collective bargaining is in that. So where are we at with collective bargaining now? In Loudoun, we were successful. So what do we do now yeah. that we're successful? What's the work? What's it look like? Well, we we're almost successful. We we have an ordinance in place that, that gives okay. us the right to the table. And so we, we hope that that's um, in the near future where we actually get to the table to negotiate with the, the powers that be on, on what we stand in need of in the workplace. So we accomplished that um, ordinance back in December of this last year after, you know, 60 or 70 right. years of collective bargaining being outlawed in Virginia. So that was a major step to get there. And so we crossed that Rubicon, so to speak, and now <laughs> right. we want to... So how does that work? Yeah, how does that work? I know we're coming up on the hour here, but literally you, you, you sit down, regular meeting and sort of just get in there. And that's what you'll be doing in Loudoun is really being at that table. Right. You know, we'll have what we call a labor relations um, administrator that is agreed upon by the county and uh, the workers. And that person will, you know, basically set the ground rules going forth about, um, you know, how collective bargaining would look like in Latin. And, you know, he's kind of like, I uh, compared to the umpire. <laughs> um, he's yeah. Just, uh, ground rules and, and everybody has to adhere to them. Yeah, well, that's great. That, I love to end on good news, Julius. And I'm glad that you, you brought that. I'd like to bring everybody up on the screen back if I can for just, I know we're going up to the hour almost done, but if we can bring Ginny back, could we spotlight Meridian? Raul, and just thank you and just say happy Labor Day um, for all you guys, you know, for what you do and making workers, uh, you know, I'm from a union family. I know like what Julie said, what a community looks like when that work disappears and what a community then is left with. So I'm very excited. Meridian, I want to give you the last word. Um, it's been a banner, you know, Gen Z, there's a lot of pressure uh, you're leading the charge and we're just, what are some, give everybody like a last word about this union organizing and whatever you want to say to the audience. Um, I would just like to commend everybody um, who's an organizer. Uh, it's, it can be really hard. We have to work together to be stronger at what we do and I am really proud of everybody who is involved with the labor movement. We're doing great work. And I am really happy that the younger generation is um, taking great strides in this campaign. Obviously, it's really important to get young minds involved so that the next generation of um, leaders and even managers can hopefully be more labor minded. Um, so thank you everybody for participating in this conversation to um, help talk about these things. Ginny. Um, I just want to say how I'm just so proud of Meridian and the work they did with their coworkers. They organized seven stores yes. in Richmond, incredible. And there's a lot more work to do. We need your support. Uh, they're leading the way, but we need to hold these corporations accountable and our elected leaders accountable for supporting these brave workers. But thank you for this opportunity. Great to see uh, Raul and Julius as well. Um, wonderful to be part of uh, this movement with them. Yes, yeah, people in the chat are loving it. Raul, any last words? Sure, uh, I mean, it's uh, an honor for me and I think it's the same for all the people that I know that are in the labor movement to be able to be in this position to, to fight for workers. Uh, mm -hmm. We're the, the only thing that stands between uh, corporations and uh, slavery. 
And, uh, you know, my message to folks out there is, uh, you know, your biggest enemy is fear. And mm -hmm. as long as you live with fear, uh, you know, we'll be under these conditions. You know, you need to put fear aside and start fighting for something that uh, is going to help out uh, in the long run. And, you know, even in the, in the best nation in the world, you still have to fight for justice. You know, never forget, never forget that. You still have to do it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, you could see how quickly you can lose your rights like that. And you talk about, you know, women in the workplace and just, or people in the per workplace losing their rights. And yes, it's never ending that struggle. Julius, last word, and then we're going to get started of our in our after chat. I just like to say our motto in SEIU is go fight when you feel well. Go we, fight when. Where we go, we fight. And when we fight, we usually win. So yeah, I like that. Okay, <laughs> that's that's gonna be my motto till November 8th and going forward. So thank you all for a, a great, wonderful, plenty strong panel today. It's been awesome. And I want uh, to just say thank you again, and we will um, continue in the fight together. So awesome. So we, it is that time we're getting up to 102. Uh, we're ending the show, but I have some stuff to remind us that thank you. If you become a patron today, just for five, 10 bucks a month, boy, you can give us that fill our coffee cups it really helps us do our work. We appreciate you follow us on social media. First of all, our social media page, our YouTube is chock full of such good stuff that it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, so much to do. So we hope you go there, go to our YouTube and like that and just watch it. It is awesome. And also be, if you're in the room today, you will get a recap email. Uh, so you don't have to worry about saving all the wonderful links and all that stuff. It will be coming out um, to just so you don't don't have to go looking for the links later and also stay for the after chat. And I want to thank you. Big thank you to the fire uh, Friday power lunch team, Robin Warner, show wizard, Stara Calhoun, ambassador of buzz, Fennell Norton, show messenger. She's not here today, but she'll be back next week. Heidi Dragneff, social media diva, our zoom crew helpers, Laura Martinez and our um, newcomer chat liaison, Michelle McKinney, and also our content concierge. Is Julia, Julie Galdo, Olivia McCall, and Sally Reinald. And thank you, everybody. And let's get busy. Let's go strong. And hopefully, join us in Virginia Beach. How much fun is that? Come down there and let's get to the after chat. Next week, we will do a show from Virginia Beach. So be in the room at noon. And we hope to see you on the sands. All right, let's roll it, Robin. Mm -hmm.